Our report on racial equality and probation was published on March the 16th of this year and was based on fieldwork that we did uh, between October and December at the end of last year. And it followed on from a debate that we've been having in uh, HMI probation and that many of you have been having in the wake of the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations and debate that happened in the summer of last year. And following that debate, as an inspectorate, we committed to three different sets of actions. The first was to look at our own inspection methodology and to query whether we were focusing enough on equality and diversity in the way that we inspect local services. And we are uh, making some significant improvements to that. And we're publishing a consultation paper today, which amongst other things talks about how we will be inspecting diversity uh, in the future. The second commitment we made was that we need to make our own workforce, particularly our inspector workforce, more diverse. And we are committed to recruiting more uh, Black, Asian and minority ethnic staff into that team. Uh, and we've, I've been running a shadowing scheme and we'll be uh, launching a competition for new assistant inspectors next week, if any of you are interested in that. So please do look out for that. And then the third uh, commitment we made, and this is what we're uh, talking about today, is to look at um, racial equality in probation uh, and the quality of services and support being delivered to ethnic minority people on probation and also the views of staff as well. And it was the first time that we've looked at that since 2004. So a long gap, too long a gap really uh, for such an important topic. And you'll get a chance today to hear about what we found in, in, that, uh, in that report. We do recognise that the probation service itself um, was also responding to the Black Lives Matter debate. I know some of you will be involved in the Let's Talk discussions that went on in the service. Uh, a new race action programme was launched uh, at the end of last year. There were some more resources to uh, support local services, works going on around pre-sentence reports um, as well. But as you'll hear, we hadn't yet seen evidence by the end of last year that those initiatives were leading to an actual improvement in practice in relation to the way that ethnic minority people are being supported um, on probation. And in overall terms, I think we found this as a disappointing uh, report. We didn't find much evidence that probation staff are speaking to the people that they supervise about the impact that their culture, their ethnicity or their experience of discrimination has on their lives or on the support that they need to get. And disappointingly, we found um, similar views amongst the ethnic minority staff that we spoke to as well. So, Although it was overall a disappointing report, we did find some uh, examples of effective practice and we wanted to highlight that um, as well. And that's what you're going to be hearing about today. You're going to hear about some uh, examples of good individual casework with people on, on probation that we identified through our inspection. And you'll be hearing about a couple of excellent local organisations that we also came across that are providing specialist support to people on, on probation. It's great that we're joined this morning by Sophia Buncey uh, from the Muslim Women in Prison Project based out of the Kidmatch Centre in Bradford. And she'll be saying a bit about what she does. You'll also be hearing about the Air Network, which are based in London. Unfortunately, uh, the Air Network speaker has been called away at the last moment to support one of their service users. So one of our inspectors will be talking a bit about the work that they, they do, and we hope that we do it justice. Uh, and you'll also be hearing this morning from the two uh, inspectors who led our inspection, uh, Trevor Wilsford and, and Avtar Singh. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing them. Next slide, please, Lauren. Before we hear from Trevor, just very briefly, a bit about, about the inspection and, and how we did it. Um, we, uh, as we do with all of our inspections, what we do is we gather both quantitative data and qualitative uh, data based on a really wide range of interviews with staff and people on probation across a range of local areas. This inspection focused on five local areas around the country, and you can see them on this map. But specifically, we looked at Bradford and Calderdale, uh, at Liverpool and Sefton in Merseyside, at Hackney and Tower Hamlets in London, at Bedfordshire, um, and at Birmingham in the West Midlands. All of those, apart from Liverpool, had very significant uh, ethnic minority local populations uh, and also significant numbers of uh, ethnic minority staff um, as well. Um, in each of those areas, we looked at a sample of cases 
of ethnic minority people being supervised um, by the service and we interviewed the probation staff that was supervising those people and we also looked at a sample of 50 just over 50 pre-sentence um, reports we did a wide range of focus groups with a whole um, range of staff uh, including uh, focus groups with 90 black asian and minority ethnic staff to give them a safe space to talk about what their experiences um, were like and we contracted with an external independent organization called um, Empowering People, Inspiring Change, EPIC, who were able to talk to, have in-depth interviews with 81 service users, ethnic minority service users, about what their experience of probation had been like as well. So a really, really rich set of data that we were able to draw on in reaching our uh, conclusions. I'm now going to hand over to Trevor, who was the lead inspector on this suspension, who's going to say a bit more about what we found and some of the good practice that we found, as well as some of the more disappointing findings. Trevor. Thank you. One of the aims of this inspection was to identify and share good practice uh, in work with black, Asian and minority ethnic service users. Sadly, there was less good practice evident than we had hoped to see and not enough to fill a good practice guide, which we would have liked to produce. What we have drawn together for you this morning are some of the ingredients of good practice, which we saw in some cases, and some of the interventions we heard from, which we thought were promising. In order to understand our approach to race equality, it's important to draw the distinction between achieving equality of access to services and equality of outcomes for individuals and groups. We heard some people say, I, I always treat all people the same and, and it was good to hear that they did not want to discriminate on the grounds of race. The unconscious bias training that many had received sought to address such discrimination. However, it only takes you so far. The effective proposal frameworks, which are designed in part to ensure that discrimination does not happen and that individuals are put forward in pre-sentence reports and pre-release reports for programmes and activities on the, the basis of risk and criminogenic need, need regardless of ethnicity, address this issue. However, inspectors were looking for more than that when we were making judgments about whether individuals' diversity needs were assessed appropriately and plans put in place to address them. In the majority, in fact, in most of the cases we inspected, we did not consider that in individuals' diversity needs on account of their race and ethnicity were being addressed. The assessments were poorer for this group than, a than uh, the group of uh, all those we've inspected in our core inspections over the last two years. The, the assessments and the plans were worse. <clears throat> Many minority ethnic service users do not start from the same starting point as their white counterparts. Some groups are more likely to have suffered racial dis uh, to suffer school exclusion and have poorer educational outcomes. Many are more likely to come from disadvantaged backgrounds and to have experienced racial discrimination. We say in the report that black people are almost 10 times as likely to have been stopped and searched by the police as white people and are three times as likely to be arrested. It was disappointing that there was very little data published about the outcomes of supervision for different ethnic groups. This is a significant gap which we feel needs to be addressed. However, if different groups are to achieve equal outcomes in employment, accommodation, successful engagement and reductions in reoffending, then their different starting points must be recognised and services must be responsive to their different needs. So As we say in the report, it's it's not, it is not sufficient to be non-discriminatory. People need to demonstrate they are addressing the earlier discrimination that has led to poorer outcomes. I'm in training. I have made you a fan, there were a couple of examples where probation practitioners had attempted to account for diversity factors as they worked through the different sections of OASIS. But these were exceptions and the OASIS tool does not prompt this. However, 
It all starts with the initial conversation with service users. Next slide, please. OK. Getting start with started with a conversation. This was a, as we say, that the assessments generally were poor because uh, matters of race and ethnicity were not discussed. In this particular case, the responsible officer had uh, been thinking a lot about Black Lives Matter, and they they didn't really feel very confident in addressing these issues. However, they decided. Well, we think I think it's important to to have this conversation with my service user about his experiences. So they so they had a go. And it was recorded that the service user spoke about his experiences of racism in the criminal justice system, uh, his experiences, what he felt when the police drove past and how his parents taught him always to keep receipts from the shops when in case he was stopped. And as the responsible officer recorded, they Felt, felt that they were are so many things that were instilled upon him that he needed to do to prevent suspicion when shopping, giving about or just being seen as dodgy. In the interview with the responsible officer, uh, she discussed that uh, th this had really enlightened her understanding. It had a huge impact on her having this conversation, uh, so much so that she told all her colleagues about it. And one of the things we were we were wondering, what, why is it so that uh, people had such difficulty in uh, in discussing these uh, these important issues? Um, maybe it was a feeling of fear of getting it wrong or guilt, or uh, maybe that these issues aren't so important or so relevant. But for some, and what what we recognised is that. Yep, you can have training on having difficult conversations, which can be helpful, and some of that happens. But really, we th what we thought was really important that people just need to to ask, what's it like? What's it like to to experience uh, to be black, to have gone through the criminal justice system? What's your ex been your experience uh, with the police, of the courts, of the prison system? Uh, service users said that uh, probation was uh, probably the least racist organisation, but. Uh, things will have happened previously, people who had experiences, and it's worth, uh, if we want to build trust with service users, to understand what people have experienced um, and to, to understand what's important to, to people about themselves. Uh, we need to see people as whole people, and engagement really has to begin with an assessment of who people are and what's important uh, to them. Next slide, please. Uh, in, in this case, it was we were thinking about the importance of uh, developing cultural understanding. This was a case of uh, a, of a Muslim Pakistani man who'd uh, been in prison for uh, uh, for transmitting uh, extremist material. Uh, there was no uh, information that he had associates or there was intelligence about him. Uh, he was obviously just trying to impress others by sharing certain material. Um, this was a case where they were allocated to uh, a, 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 a fellow uh, Muslim who from the local, uh, from, from a similar culture, with a similar cultural background, was able to use their language skills and their culture, cultural knowledge to form a good relationship, which was really important in helping him to, uh, to, to in terms of communication, particularly for someone who was uh, having difficulty in following guidance and understanding and the and the responsible uh, practitioner they modified their approach but they were able to use their uh, their use of uh, punjabi which was the service user's first language and uh, they recognized that actually building up cultural capital for him uh, reintegrating him into his local community through his local mosque was important so they found uh, a mosque which was suitable and they took time to ensure the information was shared appropriately so that he could attend there he could attend safely and that this would be of assistance to him they also looked at the home circumstances uh, building up the, 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 the ensuring that the, the family situation was a good, that he was well reintegrated there and that that family was being supported appropriately. So cultural understanding is important, 
it's uh, one way is to do some matching of people, but that's not the only way to ensure a cultural understanding. We saw some organisations, for example, Schaffer in uh, Bradford, who uh, could work with people alongside probation to uh, to provide a culturally appropriate uh, service. They also uh, trained uh, staff there in, in the different cultures in that local community. But uh, whichever way that you, uh, you achieve that cultural understanding, it's really important to do the uh, effective engagement. Uh, next slide, please. Our third slide here, our third case uh, example, uh, is about respecting and understanding differences. And this is a case example which was uh, shared to us uh, through EPIC, who were talking with the service users. And this is the service users' uh, perspective on, um, uh, on the relationship uh, with their responsible officer. So you have a, 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 a nation man in his 40s, uh, but uh, of, of mixed heritage. Uh, he spoke positively about his relationship with a, with a uh, responsible officer who was an older woman, who he described as being lovely and kind. Uh, we know that uh, for uh, many uh, black and minority ethnic uh, people, they will have experienced trauma because of uh, racial discrimination. And uh, this uh, practitioner helped them to reflect on their past trauma. Uh, having developed an effective relationship, this was in part based on the probation officer respecting his faith and understanding those obligations and what was important to him and avoiding uh, meetings which clashed with his faith obligations. But they used the, uh, the sessions to explore his ethnicity and religion, what was actually important to him and to help him to gain an understanding of what it meant to be a Muslim man of mixed heritage and an awareness of his faith obligations, expectations and how they could influence his daily life and choices. And for that individual, they explained that the trusting relationship that they'd, uh, they'd built up with their responsible officer had enabled them to uh, to, to work through difficult situations and they knew that they could return to them when they uh, needed support. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it was David Lammy in his uh, round of breaking report who, who emphasised the importance of building a trusting relationship. And that was one of the things that we were looking for uh, in terms of the interventions with uh, service users. Uh, in this uh, case, uh, it was a young man who had recently transferred from the a youth offending service uh, and uh, he was one a person of dual heritage and one of the things we did discover is that uh, those who are of mixed heritage often had worse outcomes and it appears to be an area which hasn't been explored uh, there seems to be very little research of it um, on a recent visit on a youth inspection to uh, uh, to, to Lewisham, we discovered that uh, the mixed heritage uh, young people were five times as likely to come into the youth justice system than white people. And, and, and no one had really looked at the reasons behind this. It is clearly an area which needs a further uh, uh, investigation to understand. In this particular case, this uh, this, this man of a uh, young person of dual heritage, uh, they'd grown up in the care system. Uh, they had a, a white mum, a white mum, and a Pakistani uh, dad. But uh, because he'd grown up in the care system, which is often predominantly white, he he he'd never known his family, and he, um, and this had impacted negatively on his cultural identity. He did not identify with any particular ethnicity and culture. And the re responsible officer enabled him to explore his feelings about that during the induction and during the assessment. Uh, you should recognise the, the, the struggles he's had during his uh, childhood and considering his support needs. She uh, went, uh, she took the ex went the extra mile by organising meetings of all the professionals, the uh, employment, the accommodation, the leaving care workers, the substance misuse specialists, got them all round the table to see how, how best he could be supported and she took time to build a trusting work with working relationship with him before launching into offense specific needs uh, and work on relationships 
Um, and we thought that was really good that actually she really focused on building that bridge and building that engagement and helping him to under, to think through his, uh, his culture and his identity and the things that were really important uh, for him. But building up a trusting relationship, that was one of the fundamental things that we were looking for in, in the cases that we were inspecting. OK, uh, next slide, please. We were disappointed, too, that we did not find a, a, a large number of uh, uh, specific organisations working with uh, minority ethnic service users. This was uh, quite disappointing. Uh, as I said, one of one of uh, one of these we considered was good practice was Air Network, which has been recently commissioned by the London CRC to deliver services to black, Asian and minority ethnic service users across London. Marlon Botang, their director of operations and lead mentor, was due uh, to do the next part of this presentation, but had to go to court to represent one of his mentees about their engagement with Air Network which I guess reflects their commitment and philosophy of going the extra mile for all their mentees. Uh, the following slides are his, but he has agreed for me to briefly cover uh, the material from an in, in, uh, inspector's perspective. Uh, next slide, please. Air Sports Network, as it was originally known, was founded by Colm Whitty, Whitty, a former professional footballer who died last year. It has a history of working with disadvantaged young people using sport and fitness activities as a way of engaging and empowering them. This has grown into a focus on health and well-being and tackling the range of issues young people bring, including problems with employment, accommodation and substance misuse. Next slide. Have we lost the slides somewhere? Anyway, I will continue. Um, at the heart of Air Network's delivery are their personal mentors, 95% of whom are drawn from minority ethnic communities. They engage young people in fitness and sports activity, access to services such as employment and training, and provide individual support as and when needed. Next slide, which I don't think you can see, is a, is a visual representation of their way of working. It's not a set programme, but a range of options and opportunities which are responsive to the needs of each individual. During the COVID pandemic, much of their individual support has continued via frequent telephone and video delivery, finding new ways of engaging with people, including food bank delivery. Their philosophy is to be positive, don't judge, believe in what you do, take pride in your work, give your best, be patient, show your care and always be prepared to go the extra mile. Their underlying principle is that support should be done with uh, the full collaboration of the service user and individual plans should be fully owned by service users and support the direction they want to go in. They aim to be flexible and provide support when individuals need it and not when the service wishes to provide it. Uh, good, we're back on the slide. So next slide, please. A health and wellbeing questionnaire is completed with each individual, which leads to a personal support plan that is shared with the probation practitioner. Regular out of hours support is provided through several contacts each week, including responding to crises as and when they arise and re-engaging people when they fall out of contact. Central to the engagement for many is the sports activities and fitness programmes for the aim of building confidence, improving health and soft skills. Next slide. The mentoring programme is intensive, providing support with a range of issues and assisting individuals with accessing services, including accommodation and employment services. They see individuals in prison and support them on release. For example, in one case, the service user didn't attend for their first appointment with probation, had substance misuse issues and had a place at rehab, but didn't follow up on it. The mentor picked up the service user and then took them to their next probation appointment. They were told they also had an appointment with a rehab centre, which turned into a three hour drive to get the service user there. The outcome was successful 
as the service user did their 18 months day and came out clean. That's an example of how they go the extra mile with those service users. Next slide, please. In the 19 in the 2019-20 year, the this the minority ethnic service was fully occupied with significant levels of activity. It was pleasing to see that they were monitoring both hard and soft soft outcomes along with ser service users self perceptions of improvement in their physical and mental health. In summary, inspectors judge that air network services are holistic, person centered, culturally sensitive and meet the needs of a diverse service user group with representative staff. There were examples of engagement with other services to ensure the most appropriate services are available to service users. And we thought that service users are at the heart of the service and drive the direction of the intervention with their views and feedback sought to track progress and improve the service. Air network collect data and use this to improve their service and this demonstrates outcomes and effectiveness, including case studies. So now turning to another example of a promising project we saw, which we included in our report, was the Muslim Women in Project Prison Project run by the Kidmat Centre in Bradford. So I'm pleased now to welcome Sophia Bunsey, who will now tell you more about what this involves. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Trevor. Trevor. Um, um, thank you, thank first, you of first of all to the inspector for, for um, inviting us to share some, some of our practice. Our practice. Uh, working, uh, working with Muslim, Muslim women, women prison, prison leavers. leavers. I think it was, think it was uh, especially, uh, you know, encouraging for us to be picked up by the um, inspection as a good practice because we are a community-led organisation uh, and the project that we worked on for the past eight years has really um, been taken ownership of by the community but educate the CGS as well. So I think that was something we were very proud of. Um, if you can just turn over to the next slide, please, Lauren. For those of you that don't know about the Muslim Women in Prison project, uh, we were set up in 2013 uh, to look at the experiences of Muslim women coming through the criminal justice system and to develop narratives around that, uh, around some of the drivers to women's offending, as well as what their experience were while they were in custody uh, and inevitably to produce a community response to that. Now, that wasn't something that we'd um, set up to do. It, it was quite incidental, actually. It was something that we picked up as grassroots community development workers. And I guess this is where Trevor touches on context and awareness and, and being mindful of the communities that, that you work in. So I remember as a, as a community development worker back in 2013, picking up community vibes, that actually Muslim women um, were going to prison, but we didn't know much around the reasons why they were becoming incarcerated. So as a community organisation, it was about us really um, taking the initiative to, to develop some sort of a learning around that. Um, we were also really aware that actually the conversation around Muslim men in prison superseded that of the women. Uh, and it took us time, some time to actually understand that that was because the issue of Muslim women prisoners is steeped in a very complex, you know, cultural, social stigma um, and interaction. So what, what that meant was that there was a silence around the issue. There really just wasn't a narrative around what was happening with um, Muslim women and their incarceration, because I think the community would have rather not had that conversation. And then in the wider context, what we were saying, seeing was the CGS had no particular appetite for understanding what was happening um, with, with black and ethnic minority prisoners, or they'd found that very complex or an unapproachable subject. What that did for us was really make it clear that we would be operated in an environment um, that would have to really bring to fruition the complex identities of Muslim women. So I think a lot of what we do is actually about contextualizing seven parts, several parts of Muslim women's identities, which is either their faith, their ethnicity, their culture and their race as well. Um, and I think we were actually incredibly brave at the time that when we referenced the project, we actually stuck with the word Muslim woman because women were telling us that was a core identifier for them um, to enable 
uh, their resettlement and rehabilitation effectively back into family and community life. So we, although we'd reference a gender within our title as well, we didn't necessarily reference um, an ethnic group. We, we'd stuck with how the women choose to be identified. Um, our success, I believe, comes, comes from um, several different components of, of our delivery. And a lot of that is about the context and, and where we're sat. Um, so we, we are sat within a grassroots community and we understand some of the very dynamics that play out there. Um, we also understand some of the pull and push factors that uh, played out for Muslim women uh, as they were coming out of custody. So issues of perhaps them dishonouring the family name, the community name, at having been incarcerated, um, some of the non-verbal cues and, and the power bases that existed. So I remember some women saying that they'd have difficulty perhaps reconnecting with their children because after having committed an offence, they were perhaps not deemed to be a fit mother. Um, and especially some of the patriarchal structures that existed within the Muslim communities, it's meant for us dismantling those as well. Um, so a lot of our work is, is not just about delivering a first line service to women coming out of custody. It is about mitigating, uh, manoeuvring and dismantling very complex um, issues for Muslim women prison leavers. If I can have the next slide, please, Lauren. So after we'd um, conducted research from a grassroots level, and on the previous slide, you've seen that there's three very robust community-led reports um, that we'd action. And one of the reasons we, we had actioned community-led reports was because um, we needed a community ownership or, on an issue that was very fragile. Uh, I think it really mattered um, who said what, and I understand how from a mainstream perspective, uh, really we couldn't ask mainstream providers to decipher some of the complexities and say some of the things that we've said in, in our reports um, about Muslim women uh, and the fact that actually some of them have um, struggled with very complex backgrounds of um, domestic violence, sexual violence and coercion, and sometimes a wider family crime that has led them um, where they are. Um, what we did want to do was actually, aside from the research, know that um, we, were, we were really an all systems approach. So as well as the research that we'd initially conducted, what we did find was that uh, we had to work behind the prison gate and in the community in order to form an effective model. Uh, again, I know some of the inspectors have, have mentioned their disappointment at not having come across many effective models, but one of the realities is it, it can be quite a struggle for grassroots community organisations to not just avail resources to do this type of work, but access to spaces as well. Um, so we were very fortunate, actually, because we were research led and because we had buy-in from the prisons where we were, we were able to develop a model where we were working behind the prison gate. Um, in communities and, and also at a research and policy and impact level as well, which I think has really strengthened the visibility and the case for what we do as well. Uh, one of the other things that I don't think we initially set out to do, but after writing on, on three separate occasions and nationalising a lot of our reports was, uh, I guess we had to move forward the recommendations of our own reports that were suggesting that, um, you know, that, that we would have to build an effective re-entry re model for Muslim women prison leavers who are returning back to the community. And for us, that really meant um, destigmatizing the issue of, of Muslim women coming back to communities to visibly have uh, a project that works with Muslim women prison leavers based in the heart of a community sent a very strong message out to the community around the fact that um, we're okay to have this conversation as a community, we're okay to take ownership of this, and there's an acceptance for these women uh, and, and a will to help support and, and rehabilitate as well. Uh, and our service offer within the context of the Kidmart Centre is, is perhaps very similar to, to the service offer um, that other people have in terms of support with housing, with benefits, uh, with building self-esteem and, uh, and well-being, as well as employability. But we do do things additional to that as well, which we will we'll touch on um, at, at a later point. If I can just have the next slide, please, Lauren. People have asked what makes this model different. And I think for us, the first thing that really worked for us was just the visibility and the understanding 
uh, around some of the factors that impact on, on Muslim women prison leavers as well, whether that was very complex issues around, and we've covered this in our report, Sisters in Desistance, very complex issues around the fragility of honour and family members feeling like the prison leaver had, had breached honour and the consequences of her ability to then return back to the home or return back to that same community. Um, there were other dynamics really playing out for women around um, mental health uh, and just feeling shame in, in accessing services because they'd felt they'd, they'd dishonoured and they'd breached. A clear identity is, is also a key component of our service. So as I've mentioned, um, we are very forthcoming in the fact that, that women would want to identify according to their faith values. And for us, that has actually been very helpful because at times when we see issues of marginalization of Muslim women or dishonor or perhaps them not being received back by families, it's very helpful that actually all faiths advocate on forgiveness. So we are able to use the strength of their Islamic identity to actually challenge. And, and sometimes that translates into our provision where we will have um, family, family mentoring or faith based mentoring as well, where we can have difficult discussions around um, some of the challenges women are, are facing. Also, having an innate understanding as, as a Muslim Pakistani woman, having an innate understanding um, which can't always be taught around the social context and the gendered challenges that, that Muslim women experience within the community and how to really dismantle some of those uh, and, and tackle issues of honour and shame uh, and realising what silences women. So it's, it's been very interesting that we have several cases where women haven't to this point still even gone through probation, disclosed that they were a victim of sexual violence or coercion uh, or domestic violence and, and knowing that is because many of them feel um, it affects, it is, it is a, maybe in some sense a level of self-incrimination or it will devalue them as a Muslim woman in the community is, is something that we're researching and, and looking at further. I think another component of our success has been that we are um, accessible and trustworthy uh, so I know when we were forming the model, we decided to base the Muslim Women in Prison project within a mainstream community centre. Um, and that was because many women were saying they would like a specialist provision, but perhaps they wouldn't like to endanger themselves by accessing that and everybody in the community knowing that if this was a specific centre for prison leavers or going outside of their community to access something. So I think where um, specialist projects operate is very important. Uh, and I know we have a lot of wonderful mainstream providers that do a lot of good work. Unfortunately, they're not always based within the context and the realities of where service users are based. So they're not based within the very communities that they're serving. And I think that's, that's very important that that does play out out because there's an accessibility issue and again like many other service providers we're very responsive we work out of hours and actually the Kidmat Centre is open seven days a week as well um, it, we serve communities seven days a week so we have that holistic picture around that also one of the very real challenges of being a practitioner that has to prize open a very difficult conversation around um, Muslim women prisoners and knowing that there may be certain sections of the community that are uncomfortable of that meant that we had to fit the project in a community centre where our staff as well as the project would be safeguarded as well. Um, so what's really helpful for us is actually we also manage 130 mosques in Bradford and we have done that for about 39 years. So for us it means that in, in the ethos of um, forgiveness moving forward um, and having frank and open conversations which are solution based, we're able to gain strength from faith based rehabilitation as well uh, and structure within that. If we could um, move on now to a short clip. So we really wanted to demonstrate how is it that um, Muslim women's journeys may differ to other women and how are those journeys complex. So I'll just ask Lauren to play a short clip if we can, please. I was living with my family and I call them family. That's when I went through all them years of abuse and it was at the hands of them, them that were supposed to protect me. That's when the incident occurred and it resulted in someone losing their life. I was there though, I witnessed it, but I didn't do nothing and I was scared, terrified, thinking that if I did say something, it would happen to me I'd end up in a body bag. It resulted in me going to prison, going into custody and doing a sentence for something that I hadn't even done. 
even there was controlled through the letters and the phone calls. It was just too hard to deal with everything. It got too much. So I started self-harming with anything that I could find. And then I tried to take my own life. The prison didn't really understand me, but I wasn't actually that hard to understand. There was no one there to help. Even when I reached out, there was nobody there to help. When I was about to be released, I didn't know where I was going to be resettled. I mean, the world's quite big, but I had nobody, nobody to return to or nowhere to go. I didn't really know how to live a life because I'd never actually lived independently, but my support came and it came through the Muslim Women in Prison project when I met Sophia. They took on my case and gave me a purpose to live, helping me to settle and rebuild my life. And to be honest, I'm only here today because of them. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, um, Lauren. If we could just move on to the next slide. So um, it was actually quite um, emotional for us to catch some of the stories of Muslim women prisoners, especially knowing that the, the layers of silence that, that exist for them um, and the fact that many are not readily willing to speak to either speak to camera or share their stories because of risk of reprisal or, or risk of further incriminating themselves or impacting on um, their own reputation within the community, which inevitably um, would expose them a, a little bit more. Um, Reshma's case was one of the most difficult cases I think that we have dealt with. And unfortunately, she was in a situation where um, when the family set up where an honour killing had taken place. Uh, and I think for a lot of people that do that do work with Muslim communities, sometimes there's a perception that that Muslim communities uh, and families can be quite well formed and together uh, and protective of one another. But I don't think that that was the case for Reshma. Uh, what we did find was um, she came to us, uh, it, we'd met her in custody and she really was self-harming quite intensely. She was in a situation where she didn't want to go back to where she was from and she wanted to, to relocate. Um, and the only person she seemed to connect with was, was our project because we were from the same background. She had a very over lack of trust uh, and fragility about her. And that was evidenced by, by the self-harming, but also the fact that she um, found it very difficult to engage in, and have a conversation. Um, the family, if we look at the family structures while we were doing the assessment, you know, a, a very clear history of abuse, controlling behaviours, um, threats to her own life. And, and there was a very real feeling that she'd felt wrongly imprisoned, but um, a, a strong sense of shame um, and dishonour and the fact that there would be reprisal. Um, her resettlement uh, meant that we, we relocated her closer to, to where we were. Um, and she was very much struggling with her identity because in the Muslim communities, it's not always deemed suitable for a Muslim woman to, to live alone. And, and that was really impacting on her mental health and, and self-harm. Um, and I think there were times where she, she did feel actually because of a license condition, very, very controlled by her probation officer. And I know we had several conversations around the fact that she wasn't able to uh, make new friends. And if she was, she would have to inform them of her background. Um, so the stru support structures for Reshma just really weren't there. And, and some of the some of the responses that we had to take to that were quite drastic. So I know that one of the real responses we had to make because of fear that her life was at risk was actually um, in the end, and this is going very above and beyond, I place a desk next to my desk in my office and said, this will be your structure, you will come and you will work with me in my office uh, and slowly began to give her some form of structure, speaking with other staff. She would started off by not being able to even pick up the telephone um, because she was so, her self-esteem had been so impacted and affected. Um, and we slowly managed to work with probation and overcome some of the risk factors. And actually Reshma has been with us for, for a few years now. Uh, we've helped to resettle. I know we, we did something creative where we tied her up with a cook that cooks at Kidmat centres and she learned how to cook because she really didn't know how to boil an egg when she got to us. Um, 
in her, in the period that she's been with us, I think Reshma's really felt that she has a connectivity with, with the staff at the Kidmat Centres and a structure. She now actually works for us as an employee, so she really has come far. Uh, she's gained six level two qualifications as well uh, and is off to university soon. So that is the strength of, of grassroots provision uh, and being able to, to give somebody a, an identity, but knowing that the services that you're accessing are actually there outside of a nine to five. Um, so she's she's a real success story for us. Uh, relocation is, isn't out of the ordinary for us. So if we move to the next slide, um, Lauren, please. So relocation isn't out of the ordinary for us. Reshma isn't the only client that we've dealt with that has had to relocate. Um, there's many women that would either like a fresh start or just feel it would be perhaps better for them and their families to relocate to, to another area. And in those senses, we do... Um, support relocations, introduce um, women to the areas that they're coming in, uh, and as well as, uh, as those services that are holistically based around them as well. Other things that we do, I guess, are very different to other providers are we have a family to family mentoring program, knowing that actually it's quite difficult for families to speak about having a family member that's been incarcerated. You know, families have a sense of honour within Muslim communities and other communities. Um, and to speak about how that honour may be breached can be quite uncomfortable. So we have a very effective family to family mentoring program where families that have had somebody go through the criminal justice can speak to new families who are coming through the process uh, and share and exchange some of their concerns and some of what worked for them as well uh, and again our strand of faith-based mediation is very helpful uh, because that allows us to 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 address some of the challenges that women are facing so i know recently we were liaising with a provider of a uh, um Islamic divorce, you know, some of the clients would like uh, an Islamic Sharia divorce, which isn't always easy to um, access. Uh, we also use family uh, and faith mediation where we can have um, scholars come in, male and female, and, and speak with families about some of the struggles that they're facing and how actually some of the cultural narratives shouldn't overrun that of faith. Um, I think overall, uh, for effective practice to be efficient. Uh, uh, some of our learning has been that we've had to be very creative and responsive to what we see happening within our communities. Um, we didn't see much of that change coming from the from the CGS, but we knew that we'd have to take ownership as a community ourselves. Uh, we have to understand the context in which our, our service users sit and some of the complex dynamics and multiple identities that, that play out for them as well. Um, but also a flexible provision uh, and I would suggest, I know we have a lot of probation officers um, on, on this seminar today, reaching out and, and building those partnerships. Unfortunately, for many reasons, um, the probation and, and prison domain, there's been a very clear demarcation um, around community and prisons and community and probation. But I think this is definitely the time um, to be collaborating and reaching in and, uh, and seeing how we can all collectively develop better services. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Sophia. Very, very powerful uh, messages there. And thank you for all the, the great work that you're doing and for guiding us and helping us in terms of, you know, how we can do things better as well. That's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I was involved um, with Trevor as the joint lead uh, for this particular piece of work. And um, I'm going to spend a few minutes just speaking with you about the voice of staff um, who are working within um, the uh, probation um, sector. And just to give you a bit of uh, background, we uh, we spoke to um, uh, a range of people, both through one to one uh, interviews, but also through focus groups and we were thrilled um, that so many black asian minority ethnic people engaged with us uh, through that methodology and also through um, a questionnaire that we um, uh, produced so if you are on on the call and you were one of those people who took part or completed um, that questionnaire um, thank you so very much for your for your boldness and your courage um, in uh, speaking 
um, speaking out. So what I'd like to say um, is that on the whole, the views that were expressed by service users in terms of their experiences of uh, probation was very much mirrored um, by uh, the people that we uh, spoke to. And some of the key uh, uh, concerns, I guess, were uh, that many felt that the issue of race um, had really been triggered uh, by the uh, by the now uh, you know murder of, of of George Floyd and prior to that um, there wasn't really a consistency in in dialogue um, about that particular uh, um, issue and also people reported that they were dissatisfied with the complaints and grievances um, processes that were um, in place. They felt that these um, procedures weren't um, transparent um, and unfair. Uh, and often Black, Asian, minority ethnic people um, were seen as the problem, you know, rather than people who were trying to open up um, their hearts and to speak about their um, experiences. And just finally to say they were absolutely desperate for change, desperate for change. When we explored the things that um, um, did work um, well, um, we found uh, the following. Um, we did see some examples of uh, meaningful uh, conversations taking place about injustice and discrimination. Uh, events such as Black History Month and other religious celebrations um, and cultural attention uh, was considered uh, to be essential, necessary, and where it was carried out, um, that was uh, seen as valuable. There were a number of probation providers that had provided private uh, prayer space, and that was appreciated. Um, there were some all-inclusive social events, and in a minute I'd like to uh, um, uh, speak about a case study. Um, there was some information about specialist local services, but on the whole, um, specialist services for ethnic minority people um, are very uh, limited. The COVID-19 risk assessments for returning to work, returning to offices, um, were consistently good. And we found that, um, uh, you know, the organisations had taken that um, very well um, and had um, ensured that there were proper risk assessments and people felt uh, safe uh, to return to offices. In teams where there were diverse staff, um, they were considered to be the best model. Access to um, various staff networks, in particular RISE and for some people more recently, they've had access, uh, that was valued. We found that um, there were some leaders who were beginning to put pledges around equality and diversity. And whilst you know these um, were aspirational, it was still good to see that there was recognition there. Development plans, um, where these were in place, um, they were really, really helpful and again, I'll be talking about a case study in a second. Um, proactive line management um, was um, uh, evident and this was positive. A new unit called the Tackling Unacceptable Behaviour Unit um, has been set up and people were hopeful um, that that would bring about change. And another key component that many reported to us was about being praised in public. They often said during supervision, um, they were told, hey, this is a really uh, good piece of work, but they didn't always get uh, praised in public. And um, it was good to see um, that there was evidence of um, their uh, work being acknowledged publicly. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about two case studies. One is around um, inclusive 
practice. And here, uh, what happened was that um, in this particular team for special events, the team always gathered in a local bar um, slash restaurant and two Asian members of staff never um, attended. A new member of staff joined the team and invited two Asian uh, members of staff to join the team at the bar. Um, they, they said no, they wouldn't like to attend because of their religion. No one had ever asked them why they had not wanted to join the team. The new member of staff proactively spoke up in a team meeting um, explaining that, you know, this was really not um, not good enough and that uh, a different choice of restaurant should be made. And now a different restaurant has been chosen where all staff feel able to attend. And this was an example where there had been a kind of like almost like an institutional assumption that everybody uh, was going to go to a particular bar and restaurant and nobody had ever changed that you know, as, as the months and years had ticked by. And it wasn't until a new member of staff came, noticed that, um, you know, some colleagues were being excluded and said, no, hang on a second, that is not enough. We are all equal. We share the same color of blood. And it is important that we have space to gather and to meet as one. Next slide, please. And finally, I just want to talk about um, a probation officer who we've called um, Jag, who'd been a probation officer for around um, eight years, and he was very well respected um, by his colleagues. Um, he was great at problem solving and he supported others. Following the arrival of a new senior probation officer, Jag found that his new line manager began talking to him about development plans and aspirations for the future. No other manager had ever spoken to Jag in this way. Jag humbly said he was just happy to do what he was doing and was humbled at being appointed as a probation officer. He was so proud before his family, his extended family, that he had achieved that success. Over the course of time, the new manager continued regular conversations with Jag about the senior probation officer role and the difference he could make. This affirmed Jag's abilities and given and gave him confidence to explore the role of a manager. He did later apply for a manager role, and although he was unsex unsuccessful, his manager continued to support and affirm him. And the story ends with Jag is now a senior probation officer doing really, really well and now encouraging other probation officers from a black Asian minority ethnic background uh, to, uh, you know, walk in the footprint um, that was provided for him uh, by his line manager. 